This talk is going to be on upper extremity conditions. Uh, again, no financial disclosures to disclose. Um, the uh, list of things that we're going to, oh wait, no, sorry, we're gonna do some questions. I forgot we had questions on this. So a couple questions in the beginning and the end of this one like we did on the shoulder. Carpal tunnel surgery works by A, rerouting the median nerve out of the carpal tunnel, B, eliminating bone spurs which compress the nerve, C, increasing the volume of the carpal tunnel, or D, debriding damaged axons. <clears throat> Next question, trigger finger occurs when A, the finger joint locks due to arthritis, B, the flexor tendon catches on the A1 pulley, C, the interphalangeal joint dislocates, and D, palm skin contractures form and draw the finger into the palm. And the last question, skiers and gamekeepers thumbs differ in that a skier's thumb is acute, gamekeeper's is chronic. Uh, they're synonymous, there's no difference. Skier's thumb typically affects the dominant hand or skier's thumb requires surgery, gamekeeper's does not. So let's go ahead and do the talk and then we'll revisit the questions at the end. Uh, this is the list of stuff we gotta cover. It looks long, but we'll go through this pretty quickly. Well, we'll just go through the list one at a time. Let's start with carpal tunnel. Uh, to understand carpal tunnel syndrome, we really have to understand the carpal tunnel itself. And the carpal tunnel is a tunnel, just like its name implies. The floor and both walls of the tunnel are bone, and the roof of the tunnel is a thick, dense, non-elastic, non-compliant band called the transverse carpal ligament. That's what it would look like in cross-section. This is what it would look like if you were peering down from above. Uh, and this is the transverse carpal ligament here. Now, inside the carpal tunnel, we have some structures. We have the flexor tendons for all of the fingers, and we have the median nerve. Uh, those are the occupants of the carpal tunnel. And you couldn't pick two more different tissues to stick together in a tunnel. Uh, the tendons are really like cables. They're structurally sound. They're basically pure collagen, very much connective tissue, very few cells, blood vessels, or nerves. So if you are going to design a tissue that is meant for carrying heavy loads and not tearing, you'd build it just like this. Tons of collagen, these cells, blood vessels, and nerves, anything that penetrates through the collagen is gonna weaken the collagen, so you'd minimize those. This tissue also has, because it's almost acellular, has a very low metabolic rate. When I was a kid, there was a rumor, an urban legend, that if you dug up a dead person, uh, their fingernails continue to grow after they're dead. Has anybody heard that before? Yeah, so that, and I think that that comes from here. Uh, it is true that you can harvest valuable or uh, viable chondrocytes and uh, fibroblasts days, hours, even weeks after uh, the person has died because these tissues have a very low metabolic rate and can survive off of local uh, storage of glucose and glycogen. Uh, they don't require the metabolic demands of other tissues. So it wouldn't, I don't know that that would make the fingernails grow, but uh, definitely fingernail tissue could be viable uh, days for sure after the person's dead. Um, now the nerve is a whole different animal. The nerve is a little flimsy, delicate, finicky thing. And uh, it's got axons, Schwann cells, it's just the cellular element is Schwann cells in the peripheral nerves. It has a complex microvascular system and a very high metabolic rate. If you go way back to medical school, you'll remember this. Um, maybe you will. <laughs> um, the two tissues in our body that have the highest metabolic rate are nerve and muscle. And they have a high metabolic rate because they have an electrically active cell membrane. Uh, the electrically active cell membrane is maintained by having transmembrane pumps that are ATP driven that move particles out of, from inside the cell to outside the cell. And they move those particles against the concentration gradient and against the charge gradient. So it sets it up like a mouse trap. And when you want to fire the nerve, you open the channel. And because the concentration gradient's already been established, those par charged particles rush in. They want to rush in because they're going toward the opposite charged particles and away from their concentration gradient. So that's how we set up nerve impulses. And it's a very expensive thing to do. To run these pumps day and night all the time requires a lot of ATP, so a good circulation. So this morning, 
when I was sitting, the only time, the only place in my house, even in the morning, that I can get some privacy is in the bathroom. So I'm sitting on the edge of the toilet trying to memorize all these talks, and my leg goes numb. And my leg goes numb because the edge of the toilet's digging into the back of my thigh. And uh, I didn't become paralyzed or anything. What was happening there is the pressure was pressing on my sciatic nerve, and it made it ischemic. And if you make this system ischemic and take away ATP, this whole thing falls apart. And when it falls apart, you lose sensation. Okay? So that's a great example of compressive neuropathy. And it's what happens in things like carpal tunnel. Pressure blanches. If you push on your palm, it goes white when you take your finger off for a second, and then the blood comes back. As long as there's pressure that exceeds capillary filling pressure, you get ischemia. So it really, carpal tunnel is a vascular problem. It's the microvascular system that nourishes the nerve, but it's really the vascular problem of the nerve that creates carpal tunnel. Um, so carpal tunnel syndrome, if we have pressure on the median nerve, we would predict nerve malfunction in the median nerve distribution, which means the palmar side of the thumb, index, middle finger, and the thumb side of the ring finger. That's where the branches of the median nerve go, and that's where carpal tunnel should happen if we're pressing in, uh, on the median nerve. Carpal tunnel typically is not wrist pain, okay? It's numbness and tingling. People with wrist pain may have wrist arthritis, but they're unlikely to have carpal tunnel syndrome. People with glove-like distribution of symptoms, front of the hand, back of the hand, all five fingers, that's typically not carpal tunnel. That may be more a peripheral neuropathy. Symptoms on the dorsal side of the hand, that's more the radial innervation. <clears throat> symptoms in the small and ring finger, that's more the ulnar distribution. And the symptoms shouldn't radiate up the arm. If they do, we think of a cervical radiculopathy or thoracic outlet syndrome or something more proximal. So classic symptoms for carpal tunnel are numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution. Thumb, index, long finger, and maybe the thumb side of the ring finger. Um, on physical examination, we can find this condition by tapping on the carpal tunnel. And that area where the nerve membrane is very precarious and its blood supply is poor, the physical event of tapping can discharge the, uh, the, uh, the uh, axon and you get a zinging electrical feeling in your fingers. And that's what Tennell's test is, tapping on the area of nerve compression to cause zinging electrical feelings into your fingers. There's also a test called Phelan's test. And in Phelan's test, you uh, fold your arm, your uh, wrists down like that. And uh, I'm going to try to show you on, does anybody have a piece of paper? This is the kind of, just, that you never want to see again? Go. Anything? Okay, thanks. It's a course evaluation. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, so I'm going to make a carpal tunnel. Here's a carpal tunnel. Voila. Okay. And if I do something like that to the carpal tunnel, it pinches the contents of the carpal tunnel. Tendons don't care, they're, they're good with ischemia, but the nerve doesn't like that. So what we do in Phelan's test is we do this to the carpal tunnel, and if people have carpal tunnel syndrome and the nerve uh, membranes, or axon membranes are delicate or uh, out of balance, then you'll get numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution. You'll reproduce it by kinking the carpal tunnel in Phelan's test. So that's why Phelan's test works. So this is a physical finding that's important to see. It's thenar muscle atrophy. So this big wad of muscle, if you look at your palm, you have this incredible muscle that controls your thumb. And that's median nerve innervated. And when you see thenar muscle atrophy like this, it means that the denervation has been there for a long period of time. And that's a poor predictor of success when we treat carpal tunnel. Um, there are two patients that don't get better when we treat carpal tunnel. One is the patient who doesn't have carpal tunnel, and the other is the patient who has it, but it's so far gone that nothing can recover. Okay? And this is a big red flag that this patient's carpal tunnel syndrome is gone beyond retrievable. Now, we sometimes will do a carpal tunnel release in these patients to arrest the progression, but we have to be honest up front that the chance for recovery of function is poor. Um, the etiology, trauma, <clears throat> anything that causes swelling in the carpal tunnel, ergonomics, if you're at your computer with your wrist bent, you're kinking your carpal tunnel. So ergonomically designed keyboards are meant to straighten out our wrists and unkink the carpal tunnel. Uh, arthritis, arthritis is a productive process. It makes extra bone, it makes extra fluid, it makes extra tissue, and uh, having arthritis can compromise the dimensions of the carpal tunnel. 
pregnancy and fluid retention, thyroid dysfunction, those are things that can be correctable. I guess correct, pregnancy is correctable by delivering the baby. Uh, and it goes away. Very common for pregnant women to get carpal tunnel because of fluid retention and crowding in the carpal tunnel, and it's temporary. Um, the surgical or non-surgical treatment of carpal tunnel is really meant to eliminate the source of nerve compression. So oral anti-inflammatory medications can help. If they can bring down inflammation, they can decompress the carpal tunnel. Braces. Um, this is a carpal tunnel wrist brace. And it's a Velcro brace with a metal strap on the palm side that just holds the wrist like this. And for many patients, they get into trouble at night because they sleep with their wrists bent. And you just can't consciously make that not happen. So we put a brace on them. We have them use it only at night. And just by keeping the carpal tunnel open, we can cure them in many cases just with night braces. So a night brace I have them wear for two to four weeks. And if it doesn't work after that, it didn't work. But for many patients, it works. Uh, and then cortisone injections can work too. Cortisone, as we talked about, is a potent anti-inflammatory and it gets in the carpal tunnel and it can decrease inflammation around the median nerve. Uh, the cortisone injection we're talking about is going to be best if we deliver it right here through the transverse carpal ligament into the tunnel underneath. It's less effective if it's given here or here, so we want it there. And the technique I'll show you for getting, uh, doing a cortisone injection for carpal tunnel is very simple and straightforward. The landmark is the distal wrist flexion crease. If you look at your wrist, you say, oh, well, look at that. There are two creases in most of us. And we want to look at the distal one, the one closest to the fingers, and go about two centimeters distal. And you want to be right in the middle, right in the midline. And uh, there's a technique for how deep to put it. Uh, if we put it through the skin and in sort of the skin or subcutaneous fat outside of the carpal tunnel, it doesn't tend to work. We want to be in the carpal tunnel. And uh, some people will say, well, you just you push and then you'll feel it go through that transverse carpal ligament. And this reminds me of uh, being a medical student on lumbar punctures. And uh, <laughs> they would say, you'll feel it go through. I was like, oh, yeah, I feel it. I did not feel it. Uh, I never <laughs> felt it. It was an emperor's new clothing thing for me. And uh, feeling the transverse carpal ligament is an emperor's new clothing thing for me, too. Uh, I don't think that you can feel it. At least I can't. Maybe some people can. So the technique I would recommend instead is to use that landmark I showed you, put the needle in, and really, really slowly advance the needle. And eventually, the needle will go through the transverse carpal ligament, and right in the midline is the median nerve. And the next thing that will happen is the needle will touch the median nerve. <laughs> Um, that's a little dramatic, uh, but the patient will report a zinging sensation into their median nerve distribution. And there's no harm, you're not injuring or damaging anything by touching the surface. This, I plowed into it a little bit, but just imagine we're touching the surface of the nerve with a needle. And then once you get that reaction from them, pull back slowly, just like a millimeter. And once that stops, that means you're hovering right over the surface of the nerve. And that's where you want to give the medicine. Uh, the, uh, I have some of them where I do that. I'm going slowly, going slowly, going slowly, and I hit bone. And that just means that I either wasn't in the midline or their nerve isn't in the midline. But that's OK. If you hit bone, you're on the back wall of the carpal tunnel. Just pull back a millimeter and give it here. It's going to be in the carpal tunnel. So uh, these models uh, that I made are carpal tunnel injection models. and. The way this works is you see the distal wrist crease, you go in the midline two centimeters distal, and you slowly, slowly, and they scream, and that means that you're in the right spot. Uh, you just want to pull back a tiny bit and give the medicine there. So uh, that's the injection technique for carpal tunnel. And it's a good technique. I'm not joking. I want you guys to try that. Um, so we pull off the nerve and we put the medicine in there. Um, There'll be, again, one of a few scenarios, just like the subacromial space injection. One, the patients are permanently better. And this can happen. We talked earlier about the ability uh, of corticosteroids to cause permanent fatty tissue atrophy. So you can actually atrophy some of the fat in the carpal tunnel and make room. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it can happen. And that's probably why some patients, after getting a cortisone shot, can be permanently better. That isn't the, the rule, but it's, it's, it can happen. Um, number two, the patient gets no relief at all. That's important to me. 
because that means I'm wrong, it's not carpal tunnel, or it's carpal tunnel, but it's so far gone that they can't recover, okay? And that has a big impact on what I'm gonna do in terms of surgery or not surgery. Uh, if the patient gets better, but the symptoms return late, more than four months, we can certainly re-inject them. The four-month rule applies here. Uh, the injections, one cc of corticosteroid and one cc of lidocaine, by the way, and warn them that the lidocaine is going to numb their fingers, and just for a couple hours. But if we did it right, it's gonna numb those digits for a couple of hours afterwards because it's bathing the nerve with not only cortisone, but lidocaine as well. Um, this is the patient I like the most. Patient gets better, but symptoms return in less than four months. This tells me we have carpal tunnel. <clears throat> they got better, that means we, we have a nerve compression uh, problem at the median uh, nerve at the carpal tunnel, and they have the capacity to get better. They improved, so it's, the nerve isn't permanently damaged. Taking the pressure off it brought back function. But then their symptoms came back. It's been less than four months, so re-injecting isn't a good idea. That's the perfect candidate for carpal tunnel release. And uh, those patients have a high success rate for carpal tunnel release because we've predetermined they have carpal tunnel and they can get better. Uh, so I like this, te this uh, technique not only for treatment, but also for diagnosis and uh, predicting who's gonna do well with surgery. Um, the surgery that we do is ridiculously straightforward. We open the palm. I've never seen a carpal tunnel opened up that big. Uh, this is maximally invasive surgery. Um, <laughs> you don't have to open it nearly that big to divide the carpal, the transverse carpal ligament. And uh, once you divide it, you close the skin and it's done. So we're talking a five, 10 minute procedure. It can be done under a local or a beer block anesthetic. They don't have to have a general anesthetic. Uh, that's the skin, subcutaneous tissues, and transverse carpal ligament divided. And then you sew the skin, and the blood that connects those two uh, ends of the transverse carpal ligament will mature into scar tissue, so eventually they'll have a new transverse carpal ligament that's in continuity, but it's a bigger, more, uh, it, the volume of the carpal tunnel increases. And by increasing the carpal tunnel volume, we decompress the pressure on the nerve. So that's why carpal tunnel su uh, surgery works. It's a very good operation. Uh, the only times it doesn't work is if the patient doesn't have carpal tunnel or it's too far gone. And again, the results of the cortisone shot can really help narrow these patients down. Um, next topic is a similar thing. This is cubital tunnel syndrome. Really stupid name because everybody gets them mixed up. It's really a compressive neuropathy of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. And as you would predict, knowing that the ulnar nerve services the pinky finger and the pinky side of the ring finger, that's where the symptom should be. Um, this is the ulnar nerve. It goes down here and it goes through an area of potential compression. Just like the median nerve has an area of potential compression in the carpal tunnel, the ulnar nerve can get compressed here at the elbow. And there's a spot here where you've got the olecranon process, a hard bony prominence, the medial epicondyle, a hard bony prominence, and in between the two, a sort of valley. And that's where the ulnar nerve travels, is in that valley. And if you get medial epicondylitis or any other inflammatory tissue, it presses on the nerve. The nerve can't move out of the way because it's up against bone. Uh, and that's true in compressive neuropathies all over the body. If you have some lesion that presses against the nerve here, it's not a big deal. The nerve will just move because it's in uh, compliant soft tissue. But in a few places for every nerve where there's no ability to wiggle out of it, you get compression. And that compression then causes symptoms in the ulnar nerve uh, distribution at the cubital tunnel. Um, treatment, again, oral anti-inflammatory medications can help. An elbow pad can help. Uh, sometimes repeated bonking of that area causes the inflammation and putting an elbow pad on can help. Also, the more you flex your elbow, the more the ulnar nerve gets stretched around the corner. And these uh, elbow pads are bulky enough that uh, you wear them while you sleep, you don't bend your elbow as much and it can help for that reason. They're very cheap and, and it can be effective. You can do a cortisone injection uh, just near the, uh, in that same place. You don't have to, uh, if you inject right on the bony prominence of the medial epicondyle, that will be fine. There isn't as big a space like there is in the carpal tunnel, so you don't do that nerve touch pull off thing that you guys wanna do so bad. Um, <laughs> and then the surgical solution's a little different. For the ulnar nerve, uh, what we typically do is transpose the ulnar nerve. So we find it and we take it off the, the uh, retinaculum that holds it there and we move the ulnar nerve here. So instead of going all the way around the corner, it cuts across, like when you drive your, your mom's car across the corner of your yard, 
instead of uh, around the corner of the street, um, which we all did as teenagers, uh, it uh, takes a lot of uh, the tension off the nerve. So taking this shortcut, uh, cutting the corner, uh, takes pressure off the nerve and it takes it out of this compressible area so that uh, it relieves the pressure on the nerve. The results are good for this, not as good as carpal tunnel. Uh, carpal tunnel seems to be a better operation than trans, uh, transposition of the ulnar nerve, but it's the surgical treatment for a compressed ulnar nerve. Um, let's go to the next topic, which is trigger finger. Have you guys seen this? This is really something. Uh, you don't forget it if you see it once. It's a really impressive thing. Um, the hallmarks are, it's usually the ring finger, it can be any finger, but usually the ring finger. The patient will come in and they'll say, Doc, my finger gets stuck like this. And they'll show you, it'll stick and then they'll have to clunk it out and it'll snap out with a big snap. And it's very impressive. Uh, the other physical finding is if you palpate on the palm, just proximal to the digit that's triggering, you can feel a little sore, swollen nodule. Okay? So those are the things that you see on physical exam. Um, this is a chopped off finger, and uh, I only put it up there because it's interesting. We don't have any muscle in our fingers, okay? If we, if we did, uh, the muscles in our fingers to move our fingers, if they lived in our fingers, our fingers would be big and muscular, and we couldn't do fine things. So our fingers are operated by string puppet system. The muscles are in our hand, but most of them are in our forearm. And if you just watch what happens when you wiggle your fingers, you'll see all kinds of muscles moving in your forearm. So the forearm muscles connect to the finger using a tendon. And that tendon, when the muscle contracts, it pulls on the tendon and the tendon moves the finger. So schematically, if we look at a finger from this, this is all the muscles up in the forearm and the tendons. This is a side view of a finger. And uh, this is schematic uh, showing the extensor tendon on the top, the dorsum of the finger, the flexor tendon on the bottom. And if you want to flex the finger down, you tug on the flexor tendon, and that curls it down. And if you want to then straighten the bent finger, you tug on the extensor tendon, and that pulls it forward. So it's a neat system designed to keep our fingers slim and nimble. Um, the flexor tendon has these hoops that hold, it's sort of like the eyelets on a fishing line. They keep the tendon near the bone. You don't need them on the extensor side because our fingers don't go backwards. But here, if you were bowed like this and pulled hard, it could bow away from the bone. So we hold the tendon near the bone with these, uh, they're called pulleys. They don't look anything like pulleys to me. They're uh, more like croquet hoops or something. But, uh, but anyway, this, they call these pulleys. And the very first pulley, there are annular pulleys and cruciform pulleys. I've just drawn annular pulleys. The very first pulley is called the A1, the first annular pulley. And what happens in trigger finger is that the tendon rubs against the pulley and it gets this inflamed nodule. And the nodule is big and bulky enough that it gets hung up in the A1 pulley. It will go this direction, but it gets hung up when you try to straighten your finger. And if you pull hard enough, it'll pop through there. But every time it does that, it irritates the tendon more and makes the nodule more inflamed. So it's sort of a self-propagating thing. Um, as far as treatment goes, we can put their finger in a splint. And by splinting them in extension and stopping that triggering, uh, we take the friction away from the tendon and keep it from rubbing against the A1 pulley. The infl inflammation will go down, the nodule will shrink, and that can solve the problem. But they got to wear the extension splint for a long time. Oral anti-inflammatory medications can work, but they're not typically that effective. A cortisone shot here is a really, this is a winner. Uh, really works well for trigger finger. And uh, it's easy to do. Um, let's say we're working on the ring finger. And I have a model for this, but it works so badly I didn't bring it. Uh, so I'll just have to describe it to you. Um, the landmark is one or two centimeters proximal to the flexion crease at the base of the finger. We're on the palm side. And we want to go straight down through the skin until we either hit the bone, that means that we're uh, in, in the tendon sheath uh, on the far side of the tendon, or until we're in sort of a rubbery thing that uh, feels firm, and that's the tendon. And if you're in the tendon, you won't be able to push the plunger. It's too dense. So push the plunger, hold pressure on the plunger, and pull out slowly, and as soon as the needle tip leaves the tendon, it will spread the medicine in the sheath. The tendon injection really should be in the sheath. And that's how you can get it in the sheath blindly, even though the sheath is like a half millimeter space around the tendon. Uh, so either go through, if you're pushing and you all of a sudden hit bone, you're good, just deliver it there. If you're in something that feels firm and rubbery and you can't plunge, hold pressure on the plunger, pull back, 
and you'll infiltrate the sheath there. Um, there's a surgical solution for this. It's safe, it's simple, it's effective. It's a really fun surgery to do. I'm kind of disappointed we don't get to do it more often because the cortisone shot works so well, I hardly ever get to operate on these. Uh, and it's a different surgery than you would imagine. If I had to invent the operation, I would say, okay, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna whittle that nodule down. And nodule whittling is a bad idea um, only because the structural elements of the tendon get cut when you whittle the nodule and you only leave behind a few that'll hold, that hold it. So the rupture rate is really high if you whittle on the nodule. So whittling, no good. What we do instead is we release the A1 pulley. And uh, the A1 pulley, when we open it up, it, like the carpal tunnel, will scar back as a bigger uh, opening. And sure enough, after uh, getting rid of the friction against the A1 pulley, the nodule itself will go away. <coughs> so the solution is on the pulley side, not on the nodule side. And that's a uh, trigger finger release, it's called. Super simple, tiny little scar, five or 10 minutes of surgery, great results. Uh, it's fun to do. But doggone it, the cortisone just works too well. Um, let's talk about thumb pain. There are three things that we see in the office all the time that cause thumb pain. Gamekeepers and skiers thumb, I'm lumping them together, to Quervain's disease and CMC arthritis. So let's look at gamekeepers and skiers thumb. The thumb joint, like the knee, has collateral ligaments on the sides to keep it from tilting varus valgus, okay? And what happens when you're skiing and you have a mitten on or you're holding your pole and your thumb gets stuck in the snow when you fall is you sustain a force that pulls your thumb this way. And that can rupture the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb metacarpal phalangeal joint at the base of your thumb. And that's a traumatic sudden rupture. That ligament was normal five minutes ago and now it's torn in two. Uh, this uh, doesn't show it well, but that's a bruised, swollen palm. It tends to cause bleeding and swelling in the palm. Uh, and if you examine the patient, and it's hard to do because they're uncomfortable, and you just tug this way, the thumb opens up, just like a collateral ligament tear opens up on a knee. This is a different animal. Gamekeeper's thumb didn't happen from a sudden, violent uh, force on the thumb. Gamekeeper's thumb happened because the ulnar collateral ligament, that same ligament, got stretched and stretched and stretched until it just became incompetent and lax. And it got stretched traditionally, a gamekeeper would uh, kill injured birds that were injured by hunters by wringing their neck. And this is a picture from a really disturbing YouTube video I found on how to kill a chicken uh, <laughs> with your hands. And you can see how this is gonna put a, uh, a force on the thumb that would stretch the collateral ligament. And so gamekeeper's thumb is an attritional stretching over time of the ulnar collateral ligament. Skier's thumb is a sudden rupture of the ulnar collateral ligament. So that's the way in which they differ. Um, the uh, skier's thumb can be treated often in a thumb immobilizing splint. So we're just like the collateral ligaments, those two stumps of ligament will heal back together. And in most cases, that's all you need. Rarely, the uh, two stumps won't connect. Maybe a piece of muscle gets interposed between them. Uh, and those we have to fix. But for most cases, they can be immobilized and they will heal. Um, let's talk about de Quervain's tendonitis and first CMC arthritis. These two conditions, sort of like gamekeeper's thumb and skier's thumb, those two are similar, these are similar. And really, when I see somebody with thumb pain, 90% of the time, it's gonna be one of the two of these. So we need to figure out how do we discern which one's de Quervain's and which one's is first CMC joint arthritis. The de Quervain's tendonitis is a tendonitis of the tendons that live in the first extensor compartment. And this is more anatomy than you need to know, but basically the tendons on the dorsal side of our hand go in different compartments, and the very first compartment has two tendons, the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. So those are these two tendons. They're in the first compartment, and that compartment is sort of like a little straw, a sheath that the tendons pass through. And what happens in de Quervain syndrome is that there's friction between the tendon and the sheath and an inflammatory response there that makes it very, very tender. The way to find these patients, and it's a really good test, very sensitive and very specific, is a, it has a hilarious name, it's Finkelstein's test. And Finkelstein's test is to ask your patient to wrap the fingers around the thumb and then tilt the thumb down like you're casting a fishing rod, okay? And that is, just puts the right amount of force on that first extensor compartment and those patients will really, really hurt when you do that. 
Okay, so it's a great test, specific and sensitive for finding uh, Finkel or for finding uh, first extensor compartment de Quervain syndrome. This is another picture of the same thing, and you can kind of see that tendons get tented or stretched there. Um, this can also be treated with a thumb immo uh, immobilizer. Um, it can also be treated with a cortisone injection, and the cortisone injection has to go in the tendon sheath. This first extensor compartment is part of the border of the snuff box. Remember the snuff box from anatomy. And the snuff box is this hollow space between the first and the third extensor compartment. The second stops here, it's the wrist extensors. But this dimple is between the first, this is the one we're interested in, and the third, which is abductor pollicis longus. And uh, you want to give the injection into that, into the tendon sheath of the first extensor compartment. So it's one of those things where you puncture in, get into the rubberiness of the tendon, start plunging, pull out, and as soon as you come out of the tendon, you'll be in the sheath, and just like the trigger finger injection, you can inject that tendon sheath. It's very, very effective. I see the Quervain syndrome all the time in women who've had a baby recently. Super common, and I don't know whether it's the hormones uh, of, uh, that relax ligaments around pregnancy or it's holding that new baby in the way that women hold it, but uh, I see that all the time. And if I see somebody on my schedule who's recent postpartum with a thumb problem, it's almost always this. And a cortisone shot helps a lot. Um, let's talk about first CMC joint arthritis. The other thing that can go wrong with thumbs, and this is arthritis at the base of the thumb. Not surprising that it happens here. Our fingers are hinges that go up and down. The thumb's way more complicated. It moves in many directions. It has all this muscle attached to it. It has a lot more purpose than the fingers. So the joint at the base of the thumb gets a lot more mileage than the joint at the base of the fingers. And the cartilage surface can wear off and you can get bone on bone grinding at the base of the thumb. It's also known as basilar joint arthritis, first carpal metacarpal joint arthritis, trapezial metacarpal joint arthritis, all synonyms for this arthritis at the base of the thumb. The test for this, this patient will not have a positive Finkelstein's test, but they'll have a positive carpal metacarpal joint grind test. What I'm doing here is I'm pushing the thumb into the hand and then rotating it around, sort of like a mortar pestle. I'm grinding those surfaces together. And what you'll see, uh, this is an x-ray that shows the loss of joint space, just like the other joints we've studied all day. It's a, you can see good joint space here, no joint space there. So this patient has arthritis here, and that grinding really reproduces the pain that they have. So that's the test for first CMC joint arthritis. We call it the carpal metacarpal joint grind, G-R-I-N-D, test. Can you show us that, like on your other hand? Yeah. Um, actually, do you mind if I... Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Oops. So... I'm gonna hold the hand here, and I'm just gonna take the thumb and I'm pushing it that way, and I'm just rotating it, okay? So just think about grinding peppercorns with a mortar and pestle. That's what we're doing, okay? And I'm basically just pushing, thank you, those raw surfaces together and grinding them, and that will re reproduce their pain. If it's somebody with Quervain syndrome, that won't cause them any pain. Uh, Treatment-wise, a thumb spike, a splint can work for these also. Uh, there's a cortisone shot we can give into the First, carpal metacarpal joint. That's an easy one to do. Um, the technique, uh, the cool thing about this little joint, unlike a knee or a shoulder, is if you tug on the thumb, you can actually open up the space by a couple of millimeters. And this is an injection model for first carpal metal, metacarpal joint arthritis. So the metacarpal of the thumb is easily palpable through the skin. So I start here and I walk backwards. The joint we're talking about is here. Not here, but at the end, the proximal end of the metacarpal, not the proximal end of the phalanx. So here, it's a wrist problem. So I feel with my fingernail, I can feel a little gap there. I'm going to take my needle, and it's sort of like the AC joint technique that we talked about. I'm going to walk around until I fall in, and that's the spot. Oh. There's a surgical solution for this if we can't manage it non-operatively, and that's a uh, resection arthroplasty. We go in surgically and we remove the trapezium bone, the one that it's grinding against. We just take it out. And uh, we take a nearby tendon and we roll it up and put it in there to be sort of a cushion that's not bone, it's soft tendon material. And it's a redundant tendon. It's a tendon that we can live without. So we don't miss the tendon being taken away from where it used to be. And it acts as a pillow or cushion in the joint, which helps the pain of uh, carpal metacarpal joint arthritis. Uh, some people call that an anchovy procedure because you roll it up like an anchovy. Um, 
The last topic on our upper extremity talk is uh, lateral epicondylitis. So this kind of belongs in the patellofemoral joint plantar fasciitis bundle. This is something that's hard to treat. We have ineffective treatment for it. It's common. It's a real nuisance, and it really bothers patients. Um, this is the lateral epicondyle. We said earlier when we were talking about hips that if you feel a bony prominence, that's likely an anchoring spot for, for muscle. And the lateral epicondyle is the anchoring spot for the wrist and finger extensor muscles. We were saying that the muscles that extend our fingers are up in our forearm. They are. Here they are. And they attach to the skeleton here on the lateral epicondyle of the distal humerus. Um, this is one of those conditions where the tendinous insertion there is very elastic when we're young and then loses its elasticity as we get older. So when it stretches, it starts to tear microscopically like the plantar fascia does. And you get inflammatory changes and pain. Um, as far as the history, people will complain of pain over the lateral side of their elbow. It may radiate into the extensor muscles. Uh, they'll complain of stiffness, pain with finger and wrist extension. That makes sense because those are the muscles that we're using when we uh, pull on that area. And then a lot of, almost nobody plays tennis. So uh, it, it, the tennis part is, uh, is more of a nickname than anything else. It's called tennis elbow, but lateral epicondylitis is its medical name. And very few of my lateral epicondylitis patients actually play tennis to get their tennis elbow. Um, physical exam, point tender over the lateral epicondyle, okay? And the lateral epicondyle can be hard to find. It's easy to find this. This is the olecranon process, huge bony prominence on the point of your elbow. And then laterally and medially, in both directions, there are other smaller bony prominences, the medial epicondyle on the medial side and the lateral epicondyle on the lateral side. And if you're having trouble finding those, come up afterwards and I'll show them to you. But they're palpable, even if, uh, in a heavy patient. So tenderness there is one sign. The other sign is to have them straighten their elbow. It's important that this be done with the elbow straight, because uh, that puts stretch on this muscle system. and then push with their fingertips up. That's going to recruit the wrist and finger extensors against resistance, okay? And if they have lateral epicondylitis, that's pulling hard on that muscle attachment and that will light them up. If you flip them over and do this, in other words, flexing the fingers and wrist against extension, so this is lateral epicondylitis test, we're going to flip them over and do a control and have them flex this way. That checks the medial epicondyle and its muscle insertion. So if we think somebody has lateral epicondylitis, they're tender over the lateral epicondyle, they have pain with resisted finger and wrist extension, and we test this, <clears throat> if they hurt here too, they're just a whiner. Uh, if they hurt doing this and don't hurt doing this, that's a very positive sign for lateral epicondylitis. So a great test to do in the office, elbow has to be straight, resisted finger and wrist extension, and it will light up the lateral epicondyle by tugging on that inflamed insertion point. As far as treatment, boy, the list is long because the results are poor. Uh, conservative, surgical, all of our treatment options tend to be not that great for lateral epicondylitis. Non-steroidal, stretches, and the stretch we want to do, again, it's like plantar fasciitis, we're trying to restore the elasticity to the system. And the way to restore the elasticity to the extensor muscles is to do a stretch that pulls on the extensor muscles. So elbow has to be straight and then use your other hand to pull your wrist down until you feel a stretch. And you'll feel it in these muscles. Hold it for 30 seconds to a minute, 10 times a day. And that's my recipe for all this stuff. 30 seconds to a minute, 10 times a day. And if they roll their eyes and say, oh, that's too, it's like, come on, it's five or 10 minutes. And that's all it takes, okay? No harm in doing more than that, but that's the minimum. There's a uh, compression strap, that's the stretch. You can also use a compression strap, and that's this. This is a tennis elbow band, and it works by the same principle as the guitarist capo. So a capo on a guitar is a little thing we can strap on the neck of the guitar, and it keeps the vibration of the string from going up past the capo. And guitarists use it to make higher notes, uh, but we can use it on the elbow to keep the forces in the muscles from reaching up to the inflamed spot at their attachment on the lateral epicondyle. Uh, and then the cortisone shot. And the cortisone injection we're talking about is right onto the bony prominence of the lateral epicondyle. There's a thin layer of skin there. It's hard to miss because the bone is so palpable there. Uh, but I got to warn you two things. One, this is painful. This and the plantar fascia injection are the most painful shots that I give. So this really, really hurts. And number two, the complications, the skin complications of injection 
which are probably there with all the injections, but boy, hardly, very, very infrequent with all the injections except this. I've, I see skin complications when I give this injection, and the skin complications are a blanching of the skin, and also the vessels in the skin become really prominent, like sort of varicose vein pattern in that blanched skin, and the skin gets thin, and some people, the varicose veins get so prominent that they'll rub their shoulder or their elbow against something, it will bleed, and they have a hard time, it you know, bleeds for a couple days. Um, the good news is that it happens uh, usually months after the injection. So they forgot that you did it, and it's not your fault. Uh, other good news is that it, uh, it goes away, and it goes away after a couple of months, which is a long time, but it's not permanent. So I always tell people there may be this weird skin reaction that occurs a couple months from now. If it happens, it is frightening, uh, but it will go away. We just don't ever want to inject on top of one of these lesions when it's happening, uh, and because then there's a chance it won't go away. Um, this is kind of a quacky thing. This is using uh, a uh, ultra, like uh, the kidney stone buster to uh, blast the lateral epicondyle. And uh, whenever you see weird things like that, it just emphasizes how bad our orthodox treatment is uh, when people start doing unorthodox things. Um, someone earlier asked me about PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Now I want to talk about that for just a second. Uh, here are the three amigos here. The, red blood cell, the white blood cell, and the platelet. And the platelet really is the ugliest of all of them. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a specialized particle, really, in our, be hard to say it's even a cell. Uh, but uh, platelets, as we all know, even from kindergarten, I think, they, they link together and make a clot. They're the scab makers. That's been known forever. But what's interesting, and also uh, not as obvious, is that these platelets are packed full of granules, or granulocytes, that have all kinds of interesting chemicals in them. And when platelets aggregate, that's a signal for them to jettison these uh, granulocytes, or, uh, these granules of chemicals. So they release all kinds of interesting things that we're just starting to characterize. And they're growth uh, factors and tissue healing factors, really interesting stuff. Totally makes sense that these would be the cells or the, the particles to do that because they're right there on the scene when we get injured making a scab. Um, the thought with platelet-rich plasma is, okay, we have these packets of fairy dust. We want that on tissue. We're going to uh, use, we're going to take the patient's blood. We can centrifuge it and, and easily isolate the platelet-rich part of the, of, the, of the blood. And then we're going to infuse that platelet-rich plasma into the lateral epicondyle or the greater trochanteric bursa or the plantar fascia. Um, usually they, this treatment comes up for things that are hard to treat that we're not having much success for. Um, Unfortunately, in prospective double-blinded randomized trials, we have not seen a big difference. Uh, it doesn't seem like the platelets are jettisoning those uh, fairy dust packets, or if they are, it doesn't seem like they're making a big enough difference to make that result different from just injecting saline. So PRP is out there. Uh, <coughs> most insurance companies don't cover it because it's not been uh, proven to be successful in rigorous clinical trials. But patients will ask about it, and there are plenty of spots in town here that do it. It's an out-of-the-pocket expense, and I don't think it hurts anything, and I've had some patients who feel like they get better. So I'm open-minded about it, but the idea that, it's, uh, that the fairy dust is doing the job seems to not hold water. Um, how about surgery? Surgery is also bad. We have poor success rates with surgery, and there are 13 different operations for how to deal with this, which again is a red flag that we don't know what we're doing. Uh, the surgery that I do if I get uh, boxed into doing an operation for this is a slash in the common extensor tendon. This is that group of muscles attaching to the lateral epicondyle and we, I just transversely cut that uh, and then I'm done. So this can be done in the office. One of my senior partners does it with an 18 gauge needle. He just moves the needle up and down and uses the sharp bevel of the needle under the little lidocaine and he cuts it that way. So if you're going to do an operation that doesn't work, you might as well pick one with a very low morbidity that can be done in the office. Uh, and the thought here is that we're going to make a cut in this sheet, and that cut is then going to move. It's going to restore elasticity to the sheet tendon uh, by making a defect that fills in with scar tissue, but that's more elastic than the native 
uh, sheet of, of tendon. So that's the theory behind how it works. I usually tell patients if we get to this stage that there's probably a 60, maybe 70% chance that they'll be better. Um, but uh, I haven't, so far, knock on wood, I haven't seen people get worse. But a lot of people don't get a lot better. That's it for upper extremity. Um, any questions?